Thank you, Ayuna. Uh, very challenging. I'm going to be talking about revalidation, something very practical and very grounded. Um, and I'm a general practitioner. I'm the lead for the Royal College of General Practitioners. And so I'm going to be speaking from a general practice perspective, but I'm going to try and make it as relevant to people from all specialties. And in fact, one of the really reassuring things about revalidation is there's been an immense coming together over the last um, few months so that actually the experience of a surgeon, a physician, a psychiatrist, and a general practitioner will be very similar um, through the revalidation process. So what I'm going to say, <coughs> when I'm saying something that's different for GPs, I'm not sure I'm saying this different, but other things, uh, you can take it a, a common across the board. Okay, um, so um, I'm just going to take you through a, world, a, a whirlwind tour of um, where we're at with revalidation. And, um, because it's much more important that you ask questions that are relevant to your queries or your concerns rather than me speculating about what your concerns might be. But the basics is that you know that every doctor has now got a license and that license is going to be relicensed through the revalidation process. The revalidation process is a continuous process. And the responsible officer who will be appointed for general practice and may well have been appointed for secondary care already in Jersey um, the responsible officer will be the person who needs to be sure that the way in which processes are ha occurring throughout the, um, every year, every day, every month, are appropriate to demonstrating that every doctor in Jersey is up to date and fit to practice. And if there are doubts, those need to be resolved on a continuous basis, on an ongoing basis. So it isn't a matter that a revalidation comes around and each doctor then has a high stakes um, a game of are they going to be recommended, you should know that you will be recommended for revalidation at the end of the cycle because no concerns have been raised, you've been through the processes and you're fine. And so every responsible officer should be in a position to give reassurance to the GMC about every doctor within their area and if there are concerns to address it before you get to the end of the process. Okay, it's got to not, have, if it, it disrupts the whole health service by making doctors and other people uh, do all sorts of um, hoop jumping and everything else, then that is not going to work. So it's got to be very straightforward. And so everything I'm going to tell you that involved in revalidation, hopefully, should be either on your horizons or already part of your thinking. And it's very important that I sense that the NHS in England has undergone quite a transformation in the sense of some of these things over the last five years. And where you haven't, you may want as a society to identify the areas of tension to make sure that you have them on your, um, uh, on your um, uh, radars. Now, one of the things about general practitioners is the extraordinary diversity of their careers, which do doesn't necessarily happen so much in secondary care. But it does happen. And I come across doctors with the most amazingly complex careers from both sectors. And so if we take examples, for instance, in uh, general practice, you've got people who work exclusively in prisons. Now, when you talk about patient surveys in prisons, they think that's going to be a little bit tra challenging for them. Um, uh, I've had doctors bounce up to me and say, I do nothing but vasectomies all day, every day, and I'm a general practitioner. Now, apart from the appalling prospect of waking up every day <laughs> with nothing but scrotums ahead of you all day, I'm sorry, surgeons, that you may find that terribly exciting. To me, that really doesn't sound, uh, sound uh, terribly good. Um, actually, they are general practitioners, and we need to, to revalidate them as general practitioners. There are cruise doctors. There are all sorts of... Um, uh, they, they could learn how to swim well in the Mediterranean. And uh, there are all sorts of different types of uh, careers that people have. And some people have a specialism in general practice. They may be um, a, a local diabetic um, a GP with a special interest, whatever. All these have got to be covered by the process of revalidation. So it's very, and, and the most challenging group for us, I have to say, are peripatetic locums who have little support from their professional group, who may go into a practice and leave without ever having met another general practitioner, um, and who and maybe visit a different practice every day. Um, they ha uh, have really very poor um, uh, educational opportunities, um, reflection, feedback. They're the sort of doctors who are very vulnerable. And you may well find in secondary care, um, and not perhaps in Jersey where you may have a pool of um, locums who live here, but actually in the UK, people are in and out of hospitals very fast. And often they don't get much support when they're there. So uh, that group are a group that is very, uh, very vulnerable, are very concerning in some ways, and they're a group that we are trying to make sure 
uh, are not disadvantaged particularly, but equally, that we have the right systems in place. Okay, the vast majority of doctors, whatever sort they are, will provide a standard portfolio of information. I'll go through what a standard portfolio should contain. But you can imagine a doctor who's either been working abroad, or has had illnesses, or has had multiple pregnancies, or whatever, um, there, there will be people who haven't had the opportunity to develop a standard portfolio of information. Now, in those circumstances, the RO needs to be satisfied that they have got the right standards and the right information given the circumstances, and have got to be um, confident enough in recommending them to the GMC. So there will be flexibility, but for someone who's working full-time in the NHS or in Jersey, and who hasn't got another problem to explain to, uh, to offer them challenges, they will be expected to produce a standard portfolio of information. Um, we get revalidated for what we do, so uh, let me give you an example. I had a doctor who came up to me and said that they worked at a race course, horse race course, and they um, uh, occasionally did a session there, and um, do, did they have to be revalidated for that? And there was a sneer in their voice. Did I have to be revalidated for that? And I said, how many sessions? Said, well, about two or three years, when my friend can't do it, and it's great because I can go on the Land Rover, and I sit near the jumps, and I get a really ringside view of the race. Uh, and I said, when did you last do any training for that? When did you last learn how to deal with an acute neck injury, for instance? And there was a stun sign and said, no, well, I'm a doctor. <laughs> and I said, well, if I were a jockey relying on a doctor, and they had never done or hadn't done recently any training for uh, such, uh, such a really high stakes bit of medicine, I wouldn't want to be relying on them, would you? And that's the challenge we're going to face. So where someone is doing something in their job, in their professional life, they're presenting themselves as a doctor competent to do it, and be that doctor at the race course, they happen to be a general practitioner, but I've seen uh, surgeons and physicians at race courses um, too, um, you've got to be fit for what you do. And that's always been the case, but somehow we've, you know, it's been okay. It's no longer going to be okay. You, when you do something, be sure you're prepared for it, and you know what to do because we're putting patients' lives at risk if we don't. It's not you shouldn't do it, you should know what to do. Okay, crucial to this process is appraisal. Everybody's relying on a, a robust annual appraisal, face-to-face -face with a colleague, not down the pub, preferably. Uh, preferably protected time with evidence presented, with an opportunity to discuss, not just the uh, developing supporting information for revalidation, but also the other very important bits about appraisal, which are career development, uh, choices about what you're going to do, where you believe your uh, educational opportunities lie, where your weaknesses may be, whether you want to develop in various directions. That's what a colleague can help you with. But also, they need to be sure that what they're seeing is appropriate information for revalidation. So, at the, at the base of this entire system is the annual appraisal. And I understand that for the general practitioners, that's been in place um, for about three years. That's really good news. That's, that's, that's really um, optimistic. In, in secondary care, I hope it's there for all of you. You, you would know whether it is, it is or it isn't. But there are certain groups of doctors who traditionally have missed out on appraisals. Uh, locums and peripatetic locums in general practice. Uh, staff grade doctors in secondary care. And we've got to make sure that everybody's got to be re revalidated and that everybody has the opportunity of having an annual appraisal. It's a real challenge to us as systems. Okay, F just as reassurance to doctors but also to appraisers, um, the appraiser does not make the revalidation decision. It's the RO. But what the appraiser does is say that at that point in time, as far as they can tell, the doctor is preparing for a, a, an adequate call for revalidation <coughs> and there are no concerns. Okay, so what have we been doing? Well, I alluded to this um, uh, um, uh, at the start. <coughs> All the colleges began to formulate a list of information they would like from their doctors, and the lists looked very different. So we did an exercise. I, I worked on a group with three, co three colleges, and we asked every college to set <coughs> us what they had in mind, and then we, we went around and we bartered around them. And we found that actually there was an identical set that everybody could agree on, and so if you go onto the various college sites, you'll see the same document on every college website with a little bit of commentary. And, for instance, for the surgeons, 
uh, they're going to be expected where they can to provide outcome data. Right? That's fair enough because surgeons often have outcome data. General practitioners have no outcome data by and large that's attributable to the general practitioner. We may have for the practice, but even then the outcome data is very non-specific. So we are not saying general practitioners you need to provide outcome data, but we'd love in time to get to a position where we can say that. But some surgeons will be providing outcome data, but they won't be providing other data um, uh, because they've got the outcome data. So there are some minor variations like that, but they're all within the same um, bit. The other variation in terms of general practitioners is, uh, I'll come to in a minute, is around the, how you count your CPD. And uh, we are the only college that's adopted our particular system. Um, but the, the differences, therefore, between colleges are very small. And what I'm going to describe to you as the information set is really applies to every single doctor in the UK. Um, okay, so we're, as a college, we're um, uh, trying to give a lot of advice to appraisees, to appraisers, and to ROs. Uh, ROs have been appointed throughout the health service in England, uh, or in the, in the, um, the UK, and, uh, and now they've been trained by and large, and we know who they are, and they're developing their skills and their, and their and competencies ready for the rollout. Um, uh, we've been doing pilots with prison doctors, the uh, services, with doctors in training, <coughs> locums. So we have a lot of experience about the, uh, where the potential problems lie, and we've been working to try and um, understand and to offer solutions to those problems. And we have a thing for the college, um, uh, which I'll come to a moment, called the Guide to Revalidation General Practitioner, which gives a lot of information for different groups. So if you are in one of those groups um, uh, for, and you're a general practitioner, there's a lot of information available to you. And then for general practitioners, we as a college have been developing an appraisal and revalidation e-portfolio uh, so that GPs can go through a fairly seamless process of collecting the information they require. Okay, so this guide is now in its um, uh, sixth version. Actually, I lie. I, uh, I haven't updated the slide. There was a, no, there wasn't, sorry, no, September is the last one. Um, so if you want to know um, uh, what the current situation is in your GP, this is the guide to go to very detailed bits. Um, and it changes, as you can see there. Um, uh, nothing has changed in terms of real substance, but some of the, the kind of the degree of advice or the, te the, the texture of the advice changes, and we update it regularly, and a new version will be coming out in a couple of months' time. So always, if you don't, don't print it out, put it in the bottom drawer, always go to the website and look at the latest version, because that's where the definitive advice that we can give at that time will be. Okay, so what is the supporting information? I hope this is fairly familiar to you, but I'm going to go through it to make sure that we are clear. It comes under four categories. I'm going to go through each category in turn. But we want to know what you do, uh, how you maintain your quality, what quality you achieve, and what others think about what you do. Okay? So that's, th those are the four. So I'm going to take them one by one. Now this should be, for anybody who has an appraisals, this should be absolutely straightforward. It's what you would be expected to do for an appraisal anyway. But we are saying we really want to know everything you do. Your scope of practice is called. We must, and the, your appraiser must understand what you do as a doctor. Not what you do outside medicine, whatever, but where you're presenting yourself as a doctor, even if it's unpaid, if it's voluntary, then we need to know because you're presenting yourself in that capacity. Um, uh, once you have an annual appraisal, you have um, a, a, a personal development plan, and then at the next appraisal you review that personal development plan as well as developing a new one. So that bit is now in place for the vast majority of doctors in the NHS, certainly in the UK, and private doctors in the UK are beginning to get that system in place. It's still um, fairly early in its development. Um, and so um, the, the pressure is on you, really, to have those three things, elements of an annual appraisal, PDP and the review of PDPs um, in place uh, within the next um, uh, uh, year. Okay, and then there's the statement of probity health and healthcare. So all that lot should be part of a normal appraisal portfolio that we've been preparing for many years for our appraisals and shouldn't uh, cause any distress or any new um, um, work. Okay, every college has agreed that every doctor who's in full-time practice should produce, sorry, not in full-time practice, but who's working for the year, you know, actually in work that year, should produce 50 learning credits a year and 250 learning credits over five years. A learning credit is one hour of learning, okay? 
So this is 50 hours, 250 hours, uh, uh, 250 hours in a year, and 250 over the um, uh, five years. Now the Royal College of General Practitioners is exactly the same, but we've said that if you do something with your education, anything with your education, you just use it, you can double your points. Now, why have we done that? Because we know that lots of general practitioners, we suspect it applies way beyond general practice, spend a lot of their time going to totally futile education. It's not much to their education needs, they don't pay attention, they don't do anything with it when they get back to base, and it's just a routine.